Hello, I'm Dennis Taylor, and welcome to the Opera Den. Like many opera fans, I have a particular fondness for the tenor voice. From the sweet lyric melodies to the exciting high seas, there's nothing like a great tenor to energize an audience. Through the rich archives of historic recordings, today we will hear excerpts from 14 interesting tenors, all born in the 19th century. Their recordings provide a link to days gone by and reveal great artistry by performers raised in the grand traditions of historic teachers. Notice, I'm not saying that these are the best tenors from that period, because there are some glaring omissions from that list, starting with the great Enrico Caruso. I selected these singers based on their unique vocal qualities. Many of their names may not be familiar to you, but most were highly regarded in their day. The focus of today's program will be on the singer's vocal qualities and not on the message conveyed by the arias. Before I proceed, though, I want you to see this photograph of the first recording studio in England in the early 1900s. The electronic microphone had not yet been invented. The recording apparatus consisted of a large horn that focused the sound onto a stylus that cut the grooves into a wax disc. All recordings made prior to about 1925 used a variation of this setup. So I ask for your indulgence in coping with the sonic deficiencies inherent in historic recordings. I believe their artistic value outweighs any perceived shortcomings. I will present these singers in order based on their age, starting with the Italian Francesco Tamagno. Francesco Tamagno was born in Turin, Italy in 1850. He made his operatic debut in Turin in 1873 and at La Scala Milan in 1877. He worked closely with Verdi over the next decade and sang the tenor roles in the revisions of Simone Boccanegra and Don Carlo. Tamagno is best known as the creator of the role of Otello. He is the tenor Verdi chose for the 1887 premiere, and the role was written for his vocal qualities. As you will hear, his voice was a powerful stentorian instrument. The gramophone was in its infancy when he made this recording in 1903, some 16 years after his debut in that role. In that same recording session, when Tamagno heard the first playback of a different aria from Otello, he was so amazed and overcome with emotion that he embraced the machine that preserved his voice for posterity. Here is his exultant entrance in the opening scene of Verdi's Otello. Léonce Antoine Escalais was born in a small town in southern France in 1859. He began vocal studies at the Music Conservatory in Toulouse and later at the Paris Conservatory. He made his Paris opera debut in 1883 as Arnold in Rossini's Guillaume Tell. Escalais was short in stature and his physique was at odds with the heroic characters he portrayed but the voice more than compensated for his physical limitations. Between 1892 and 1908, 
He sang more often in Italy than in France, and sang some of the same roles that Tamagno had sung, earning him the nickname the French Tamagno. But unlike his Italian counterpart, Escalai's classic training gave him a command of contrasting styles. For not only could he sing brilliant high notes, he could also gracefully execute bel canto trills and runs. We will hear the full extent of his vocal skills in the Sicilian from Meyerbeer's Robert Le Diable in this recording made in 1905. <laughs> Edmond Clément was born in Paris in 1867. He was studying civil engineering before entering the Paris Conservatory. He made his debut at the Opera Comique at the age of 22 and was the theater's principal tenor for the next 20 years. His elegant style and scrupulous technique made him the preeminent French lyric tenor in the late 19th and early 20th century. His recording of Decorieux's aria, The Dream, from Massenet's Manon, is among the finest by any tenor in the last 100 years. While in America, he sang the role of Werther at the Metropolitan Opera, opposite the Charlotte of Geraldine Farrar. In her biography, she described Clément as, quote, an artist of the most exquisite taste and dramatic elegance, unquote. He was, as you'll see, a handsome man possessed of great acting skills to match his terrific voice. You will hear him sing the aria Pourquoi me réveiller from Massenet's Werther in a recording made in 1916.
première Et tes yeux vainement Chercheront ma douleur Ils ne trouveront plus que ta Sobinov was born in a small town northeast of Moscow in 1872. His mother was a singer and may have inspired his early interest in music. He played the guitar and sang in school choirs. He attended law school in Moscow and following compulsory military service after his graduation, he began his career as a lawyer. But he continued singing though and in 1897 was encouraged to try out at the Bolshoi Theater in Moscow. His successful audition resulted in a two-year contract. Ultimately, he performed at the Bolshoi, the Mariinsky Theater in St. Petersburg, as well as all the major opera houses in Europe in a career spanning three decades. His lyric voice was praised as bright and warm with admirable legato. He was very popular, especially in his native country, where he was designated as an imperial court singer and People's Artist of the Union of Soviet Republics. In this 1910 recording, Sobinov sings Levko's Serenade from the comic opera May Night by Rimsky-Korsakov. Dmitry Smirnov was born into a wealthy family in Moscow in 1882. His stepfather had a keen interest in singing and encouraged the young Dmitry to sing in school choirs. He made his operatic debut at the Mariinsky Theater in St. Petersburg in 1903. While he shared a similar repertoire with Sabinov, and it's easy to confuse the two due to the alliterative similarities of their names, the singers distinguished themselves in other ways. While Sobinov remained in Russia after the 1917 revolution, Smirnov left 
and pursued his career primarily in other Western European countries. Smirnov's voice may not be as attractive as his counterpart in terms of pure sound, but he was regarded as a more interesting and expressive singer. Vocal critic John Steen writes, quote, He had the distinction of preserving a fully flavored Russian character while showing a most imaginative feeling for the ways of the Western tradition, unquote. Here's a portion of the well-known aria from Tchaikovsky's Eugene Onegin, sung by Onegin's tragic friend Lenski. This recording was made in 1909. Pertile was born in northern Italy in 1885. He made his operatic debut in 1911 in the small town of Vicenza. After singing in regional companies in Italy and in South America for several years, he made his La Scala debut in 1916. He sang only one season at the Met in 1921-22 and sang two mixed reviews at Covent Garden from 1927 to 1931. But Pertile was the leading tenor at La Scala from 1922 to 1937 and was the favorite of its principal conductor, Arturo Toscanini. He was greatly admired by many of the best tenors who succeeded him. But the worst aspects of the Verismo style that favored volume and excessive emotionalism came at the expense of a smooth vocal line which had been the hallmark of the Italian vocal tradition. Fortunately, those faults are not on display in this recording of an aria from Bellini's I Puritani, recorded in 1930. <laughs> Oh, 
Spanish tenor Hippolito Lazaro was born in Barcelona in 1887. He didn't get into singing until his teenage years. Encouraged by friends, he began performing in some local comic operettas known as Zarzuela at the age of 18. He began formal voice studies and following military service, made his opera debut in 1910. He moved to Rome to further his vocal studies and took Italy by storm. A performance at La Scala Milan attracted the attention of opera composer Pietro Mascagni, who promoted his career by entrusting him to sing a principal role in the premiere of a new opera in 1913. Lazaro traveled west and performed in Buenos Aires, uh, Rio de Janeiro, and New York between 1914 and 1920. His singing career lasted about 40 years and included a wide range of both traditional operas as well as Spanish Zarzuela. With its distinct vibrato, his voice was considered by some critics to be not as refined as others in this anthology, but he sang with great passion, as you will hear in this 1916 recording of Elo Chevin Le Stelle from Puccini's Tosca. Tito Schipa was born in a small town in southeastern Italy in 1888. His early musical interests were in piano and composition before he began serious pursuit of vocal training in Milan. He made his operatic debut as Alfredo in La Traviata in 1910. He continued to sing in regional venues in Italy for the next several years. In 1919, he traveled to the United States and joined the Chicago Opera Company where he appeared regularly until 1932. He sang at the Met for several seasons and many times at La Scala for about 20 years. He was a lyric tenor with a style considered the epitome of elegance and grace. 
In many ways, he was the polar opposite of Pertile, who we heard previously. Schipa had a limited repertoire of operas and songs that were well suited to his voice. He may not have been an exciting singer, but well loved for his pleasant tone and praised for his smooth vocal line. In this 1929 film, he is seen singing an Italian translation of an aria from the comic German opera Marta. Antonio Cortes was born on a ship en route from Algeria to his native Spain in 1891. He joined the opera chorus in Barcelona and made his solo debut in 1916. He traveled to Buenos Aires in 1917 and sang the role of Beppe to Enrico Caruso's Canio in a production of Pagliacci. His success in that role led to him becoming Caruso's protege. Cortese was a regular at Chicago Opera from 1924 to 1932. In spite of his immense talent, his career faltered due to the unfortunate timing of the Great Depression, as well as the unrest in his native country prior to the Spanish Civil War. Cortese made some of the finest tenor recordings, including the one we are about to hear. Decades before, it became an overused vehicle for tenors to see who could sing the final word the longest or loudest, Cortese recorded Nessun Dorma in 1929, giving an object lesson in how this aria should be sung. Whoa! 
Born Archer Ragland Chomley in Los Angeles in 1892, he began playing the violin at age eight. He graduated from USC where he studied science and violin. He filled in as a soloist for an indisposed colleague as a member of a university choral group. This led to five years of vocal studies with a teacher in Los Angeles where he made his opera debut in 1916. After military service in World War I, he began taking his opera career seriously and was discovered by Antonio Scotti, the famous Italian baritone who frequently sang with Caruso. Trombley made his Metropolitan Opera debut in 1920 and the critics were enthusiastic in their praise of his voice, one noting similarities to the great Caruso. Trombley sang over 200 performances at the Met over the next 14 years. It's surprising that he is not better known today. This 1922 recording of an excerpt from Meyerbeer's L'Afrikan will give you an example of his wonderful voice. Renato Zanelli Morales was born in Valparaiso, Chile in 1892, but was taken by his family to Europe at the age of two and grew up in Italy and Switzerland. He returned to Chile in 1911 to work in the office of his father's business, but he studied voice in Santiago and made his opera debut as a baritone in 1916. Zanelli sang baritone roles at the Met from 1919 to 1923 but was told by Toscanini that he really should become a tenor. He made the transition through private study and debuted as a tenor in 1924. The next year he sang Otello in Turin. By 1927 he was hailed in Italy as Tomagno's true successor. He had a brilliant career as a tenor, singing at Covent Garden, La Scala Milan and in South America. Unfortunately, he died from cancer at the age of 42. In this 1929 recording, you will hear why he was so highly regarded. 
Here is the improviso from Giordano's Andrea Chedie. small town southeast of Rome in 1892. He made his opera debut in 1919 and within a few years became one of the leading tenors at La Scala as well as the Met in New York where he sang over 300 performances between 1923 and 1933. Lori Volpi was an intelligent man with one of the finest tenor voices of the 20th century but also had a fragile ego and fiery temperament. He refused to sing with a soprano who got more applause than he did. He punched a critic in the nose for giving him a bad review. The Metropolitan Opera paid him ten cents more than his rival so that he could boast of being the highest paid singer on their roster. In one of the five books that he authored, he described his own voice as being without parallel and endowed with features unknown to others. Was he really that good? Judge for yourself as you listen to this 1928 recording from Bellini's Norma. <laughs> Oh, 
Georges Thiel was born in Paris in 1897. He spent two years at the Paris Conservatory and another two years studying in Italy with a renowned teacher. Thiel made his debut at the Opera Comique as Don José in Bizet's Carmen and next at the Paris Opera in 1924 in Massenet's Thaïs. While he specialized in the French repertoire, he was also admired for his Italian and German roles, which he sang at major opera houses in Italy, Vienna, London, and South America. He retired from the stage in 1953 and died in 1984. I'm going to quote from the New York Times obituary because it so succinctly described his vocal attributes. Quote, Mr. Teal's brilliant, evenly produced voice represented a blend of Italian vocal technique with the refined phrasing and crystalline enunciation of the now nearly moribund French singing school. Unquote. One of his great roles was Aeneas in the epic Berlioz opera Les Troyans. Here is the final two and a half minutes of a scene from Act Five, recorded in 1934. <laughs> Helga Roswinger was born in Copenhagen, Denmark in 1897. After graduating from a technical school in Copenhagen, he started his working career as a chemist. He had taken some singing lessons in his teens. While traveling in Germany, he met a young soprano who would later become his wife. She encouraged him to sing duets with her. One of his performances attracted the attention of an agent for a small opera company who asked Roswinger to audition for the upcoming season. Amazingly, he made his debut in the major role of Don José in Carmen in 1921. He made his Berlin State Opera debut in 1929 and spent most of his career singing in Germany and Austria and sang all of his roles in German. His voice remained intact with ringing high notes well into his 60s. He made his debut at Carnegie Hall at the age of 65. 
This next aria is from the comic op French opera Les Postillons de L'Angemeau by Adolphe Adam. In a recording made when the tenor was 39, you will hear Rosevenga sing with gusto, and near the end he easily tosses off a thrilling high D. <laughs> Ho, 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 ho. 